Dear all, me direct thanks you for joining this webinar, the 12th in our me direct talk series, where we aim to introduce you to financial experts and asset managers so that they can share their views on the financial markets and investment opportunities with you. Me direct has always been at the forefront of providing you with the latest on the investment world, and we aim to continue doing so through our regular updates on our website and social media. Our team of experienced wealth advisors are always available to assist you. For this edition, we have partnered up with Fundsmith Equity Fund. Terry Smith will be giving an update on the performance of the fund together with his views on the financial world and the current trends. Right. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, slides are up there. Obviously, I'll run through those and uh, I'll come on screen at the end for the Q&A section. Uh, there's a disclaimer and uh, there's topics that I intend to cover today. Performance, investment strategy, the so-called rotation, uh, the hot topic of inflation, ESG and uh, some uh, other things that uh, obviously could be together under other. <clears throat> Performance, first of all, probably the most important bit for most people. Uh, as you see last year uh, in Sterling, we were up 22.1%. Uh, our Benchmark the MSCI in sterling with dividends reinvested was up 22.9, so we underperformed by about uh, three quarters of a, of a percentage point. And uh, obviously, we'd rather not underperform, but uh, as I hope we've made crystal clear to people, we don't expect to outperform in every single reporting period or every market condition. And if you had to pick a set of market conditions where that was a little unlikely, last year was pretty high on the list of them, insofar as obviously it was a pretty bullish period for equities. And if you look back, uh, over that uh, chart in front of uh, so that to table in front of you there, you'll see that we um, don't outperform as much or struggle to outperform when the markets are particularly bullish. You can see 2019 we did, but not by much. Uh, and in 2016, we only equaled the market when it was up very strongly. Uh, when the rising tide uh, floats all ships, uh, then we struggle to outperform. And last year, of course, the rising tide was the market scenting recovery from the pandemic and sending up a lot of things of a sort that we uh, we don't and, and won't own. Uh, what worked and what didn't last year in terms of our largest contributors uh, to our performance and largest detractors? There they are, the top five on both sides. I'll run through them. Uh, on the, the top five contributors, I think the obvious common theme is that we continue to make money with old friends. Uh, as you know, I say, uh, you know, the old saying of nobody ever got poor taking a profit is almost certainly literally true, but they may not have got very rich either because uh, once you've got one of these things right in terms of your selection and, uh, and entry point, quite often it's a good idea to, to stay with them for long periods of time. That's actually Microsoft's seventh uh, annual appearance in our table, which is remarkable for a company of, it, of its size. I think it's the um, fourth appearance for IDEX and the second appearance for Novo Nordisk and um, uh, for Estee Lauder. So you can see we are seeing repeat uh, positioning from people that uh, or kind of companies that have uh, contributed substantially in the past. Looking at the detractors, there's not really a common theme, but the first one actually, if anything, contradicts what I've just been saying. PayPal has been one of our consistent performers in the past, had a poor year last year. Why? Um, basically, all of the companies that are in the payments, accounting, software, uh, and related areas. I uh, all talk about the funnel, how to get higher up the funnel, which is the transactions we undertake, which leads to whatever they do, accounting, payment processing, etc. Uh, in the case of PayPal, they talked about creating a super app, which covers an awful lot of the activities we undertake and drives pay and therefore payment volume to their system. Uh, and they took that so far as to engage in uh, talks, at least with Pinterest, the social media platform, uh, and as a result of underperformed, we're Frankly, a bit worried about that. Um, we're not massively keen on companies that don't stick to their knitting in terms of what they do. Um, and uh, the idea of acquiring to uh, to get the uh, the business source to you doesn't uh, fill us with joy. But it's still a very well positioned uh, company in terms of online payments. Uh, and the other performance is certainly taking the edge off the, the valuation. So we're sticking with it at present. Amadeus, is a pretty obvious one. Airline reservations, still not a great business at the moment. Uh, our take on Amadeus is as we've said for the last couple of years, we're pretty sure it's going to survive all this. We're pretty sure it will emerge with a stronger uh, market position amongst its competitors at the end of these uh, events that we're going through. And very importantly, unlike IHG, which I'll come on to talk about later because we sold it, the share price doesn't yet discount those features in my view, which is to say that it will survive and it will have a better market position. So we're sticking with it. Kone underperformed. 
Uh, its biggest market is China, and obviously the downturn in Chinese construction uh, has weighed heavily upon it. Uh, we're sticking with it. Uh, the uh, installation of new equipment obviously is the pipeline for the future, but it's not where the majority of the money is made. Uh, also, although the Chinese construction market in terms of commercial construction has obviously been affected by events, uh, the, uh, the public market continues on a pace. There have been uh, quite a few big announcements, in fact, of elevator and escalator contracts, which our friends Kona have participated in. And this is a pretty resilient business, so we're sticking with it. Unilever has obviously hit the headlines, both in terms of what we said about it to try and explain our view and in terms of what's happened since. And I thought perhaps I might leave that to the end. Um, if that's of interest to you in terms of uh, saying more about it, I'll pick it up perhaps in the questioning world right now. Brown Fullman uh, Distillers, distills Jack Daniels, also has a big uh, share of the tequila market. We've been buying that one into weakness. That's pretty typical. We quite often cover these companies for a long time. They're in our investable universe. It's a period of weakness that gives us our chance to get in at a reasonable valuation. Uh, Brown Former's weakness has been driven by two fundamental headwinds. The EU tariff on spirits, which was imposed in a tit for tat uh, with the, uh, the war that's been going on between the uh, trade wars been going on between the US and the UK, uh, the EU over um, uh, digital companies primarily and their profitability and uh, where they should be taxed which has spilled over into tariffs on EU drinks and then, of course, tip for tap with tariffs on American drinks. The other big headwind is the travel retail business, which has been largely absent for most of the last 18 months. Both of those headwinds are now disappearing. The tariffs are gone um, and presumably travel retail will now uh, continue to open up. And we think that we've probably got a good entry point for that. Uh, investment strategy. Hopefully you're familiar with this by now. We've got our three stage strategy. Uh, only invest in good companies. Try not to overpay, then do nothing. I'll take you through each of those in turn to see if you think we're sticking to them. Uh, only invest in good companies first. And there's our look through table, which we published every year, where we look at five metrics of how our companies are operating uh, to see how they stack up against the index. You'll see that the return on capital employed, ROCE, which we put on the top line because we think it's the most important indicator, was 28% in 2021. Uh, it's uh, recovered from the 25% low that we had in 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, the index also recovered. You can see 16% on the S&P, 14% on the FTSE. So the, both the index and our companies have recovered somewhat from the events of 2020, but our companies remain producing about twice as much return uh, as the index companies. Gross margin, the difference between revenues and cost of goods sold, companies taking ingredients, components, services, do things to them and turn them into products and services which they sell. This measures the markup between the inputs and the outputs. Our company is 64% last year. You can see that's pretty rock steady around that level. Uh, they're taking in things for 36 and selling them for 100 in English. Uh, the, uh, the indices you can see both at 45%. The companies in the index are taking things in at 65 and selling for 100. Clearly, it's better to take them in for 36 and sell them for 100 than, than 65 and sell them for 100. Uh, but um, so the, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, this is also quite important when you get to discuss our friend inflation in terms of the fundamental safeguards that companies may have against it. So I'd like to come back to that ratio a bit later, if I may. Um, operating profit margin. So the gross margin then taking out all of the selling general and administrative expenses of the companies. You can see our companies again had a bit of a recovery last year from the low of the pandemic of 23 to 26 percent. The index also had a bit of a recovery up to about an average of 16% across those two indices. Our companies are still producing about two thirds more operating margin than the index. Cash conversion, our companies produced 95% last year. As you can see, looking across the years, they, they always produce round about 100% free cash conversion. The index was pretty good again, 106% uh, and 124%. I'll come back to that in the next slide because I think what's happening is a, is a temporary um, uh, good patch for the index caused by the, uh, the events of the pandemic. And I'll, I'll just explain that in the next slide. Interest cover. So I would suggest to you those operating metrics suggest that we've got companies which are way better than the index in terms of their financial performance. Uh, what the balance sheet's like, well, this is measures the operating profit cover and how much cover that provides for their interest and, uh, and rental payments on leases. You can see our companies had 23 times cover, which was up very substantially from the previous year. The index is about eight times. 
These are very conservatively financed companies. They are not producing great performance as a result of financial engineering, which we like. I said I'd say a bit more about cash flow. Here's just two companies that I've picked out to try and illustrate what's going on. BP, which we don't own and never would own, and L'Oreal, which we do own. And you can see um, L'Oreal's cash conversion has been 100% or more in most years. It's punching on pretty well at the moment, about 130%, and it's averaged about 110% over the years uh, that you can see on the table. Uh, BP was 147% last year, which is uh, obviously very good. But if you look back over the history, it's incredibly volatile. It's got minus 141% for one year, and the average is 66% compared with 110% for uh, L'Oreal. Uh, and in fact, if you look at what's happened over the, the long sweep of it, what's happened uh, in terms of that 147% free cash conversion is, if you look across back across to 2014, the, the improvement is because they've actually managed to depress profits quicker than they've depressed cash flows, which is a kind of a, a rather negative way of getting your cash conversion up. I think what's happening in general in the index and the companies that we don't own is they had a bigger downturn than our companies in sales, but they also had very big supply chain problems, which meant that they depleted their working capital. They've been carrying a lot less stock. They've had far more stock outs uh, than they've had in history. Uh, and so as a result, their conversion of profits into sales has been higher, even though the profits have been lower, rather like our friends BP there. And I think what you'll see is as a recovery comes through in 2022, very probably the cash conversion for the index will revert back to uh, its rather patchy level where it usually uh, averages around 80 percent for most companies. Don't overpay. Uh, probably the most vexed part of this strategy for, for the last almost every year that we've been running it. Our free cash flow yield, so the free cash flows produced by the companies, which belongs to us, the shareholders, divided by their market valuation, you'll see last year was 2.7 percent, which is near enough unchanged on the previous year, which is not that surprising. You'll see in the grey bar down at the bottom that the portfolio's free cash flows grew 20 percent last year. So the free cash flows pretty much grew in line with the portfolio performance. So we didn't get any help from valuation uplifts uh, last year, which is pretty much the way we prefer it, actually. How does this compare? Well, we're actually valued at about twice the uh, the multiple or half the yield of the FTSE. You'll see the FTSE's got a 5.4% free cash flow. There's so much poor quality stuff in the FTSE that I think the comparison uh, is almost meaningless. The S&P is a more meaningful comparison. You'll see it's got a 3.6% free cash flow yield. Uh, obviously, quite a lot of our companies are in that calculation as well uh, in the S&P because we own quite a lot of companies there. So our companies, uh, if you look at it, are about 20, 25% more expensive than the S&P. And what we've got to ask ourselves and you've got to ask yourself is, is that um, uh, higher valuation more than made up for by the quality of the companies? Because I think the value when you come to talking about stocks has, has had an unfortunate shorthand in, in recent years where people think low valuation equals uh, expensive, uh, sorry, cheap, and the high valuation equals expensive. And that simply isn't the case. Uh, you, you need to take into account what you're getting in line with that valuation. And I would suggest to you, if you think back to that look through slide, or you look at the relative free cash flow growth that our companies are producing, there is a reasonable likelihood that, uh, that our valuation is justified or more than justified uh, when you compare it with the index. Do nothing, third leg of our strategy. Uh, this is a quite a busy table, so I'll just focus on two bits. One is the portfolio turnover rate, three lines from the bottom, where you see it was 5.6% last year, pretty much in line with our kind of normal activity, not very much in other words. Uh, when I get to the slide that actually deals with the changes we made, uh, usually what people find interesting is there are far more changes than you think for 5% of the portfolio. That's usually because things we're selling have already descended to a small part of our portfolio because we're not adding to them. But I'll talk about that in a moment. How much did all this dealing cost? Our voluntary dealing costs, so where we decided to change a stock, not the dealing costs which relate to uh, inflows or outflows for the funds, you'll see we're 0 0.009 of a percent, just under one basis points. We spent about 2.2 million in dealing in total on a 28 billion pound fund. Uh, this is clearly a very, very low uh, cost fund in terms of dealing and uh, obviously not a great uh, benefactor for the uh, for the broking industry. What did we actually do in this do nothing? Quite a lot, as you can see last year, uh, in terms of names, um, as we did in 2020. I think the reason for that is 
the events of the pandemic have thrown up far bigger changes in terms of valuation um, and, uh, and effects that have made us think about opportunities. Uh, is what's mainly driven that. I'll just run through them for you. Beckton Dickinson, which we sold medical equipment uh, and devices company, was something we'd held since inception, but we became quite concerned uh, about Beckton Dickinson. It was a serial acquirer, uh, made some quite big acquisitions. In fact, our, most of our stake in Beckton Dickinson came from their acquisition of CR Bard, the catheter company, and we got quite worried about their execution uh, in relation to these. Bard, which they acquired, which had been in our portfolio, uh, was a company that we thought had very big uh, opportunity in the emerging markets. Bex and Dixon don't seem to have managed to capitalize upon it so far. Um, they also uh, have had some other quite big acquisitions, one called Care Fusion, um, and they ran into some operational difficulties with a thing called the Alaris pump, which is a drug supply pump, uh, which they uh, had withdrawn as a result of FDA action. And the management seemed to us to be, frankly, a bit blasé about how long it would take to correct the problems that the FDA had identified. And at least at the moment when we sold it last year, uh, as opposed to the sort of we will have all this sorted out in a, in, in, a, in a quarter kind of approach, they still didn't have the, uh, the product back online. And I guess our net conclusion was that they'd become so distracted by their acquisitions that they uh, weren't really sufficiently focused on execution. And so out they went. Uh, we sold into Continental Hotels. Uh, nothing wrong with the model of not owning hotels, but franchising them and managing them and charging royalties. Uh, the problem for us was, firstly, the Intercontinental Hotel share price was back above its pre-pandemic highs, and the business certainly wasn't back above its pre-pandemic highs. Uh, and in fact, the travel retail, uh, the, uh, the the business travel business, I think, uh, may struggle for some time to get back there. Um, and it was already a bit on the worry block. So, you know, the share price had discounted recovery fully. It hadn't fully recovered. And we thought that the um, business travel bit wasn't showing great signs of getting back to normal in the near future, as we can tell from the fact that we're doing events like these uh, now without meeting. And um, it was already, as I say, in the sort of worry group of our stocks because the free cash flow had stagnated somewhat in recent years. So, again, that's how it went. Intertech we sold, that's the UK based. To testing services business is one of the big three in the world. Uh, we like the testing area. Uh, we think that the secular trends which are driving more and more testing, uh, international trade, health and safety, the pandemic itself, uh, ESG and the application of ESG factors are all things which are driving more and more testing. The problem is the services companies seem to us to have a, a nasty habit of always misfiring on one or more cylinders. So something is always a problem. The supply chain isn't uh, functioning. Uh, the oil and gas industry has had a downturn, so we're not seeing things come through, et cetera, et cetera. So we decided to focus our testing uh, investments on the uh, supply of testing equipment which is used. So uh, people like our Waters Holding, which is a, a company that does mass spectrometry, liquid chromatography, and thermal imaging equipment and sells software spares and services to a tame client base. We think that the reliability of those businesses in terms of their returns is much higher. And at least so far, I think that's been borne out by the, the relative performance of things like Waters against Intertech. Uh, Sage, we sold the UK's biggest software company, accounting software business. Um, we had held it for quite a long time. We held it through an unscheduled change of CEO. The company had disappointed, I think, and got behind the the market in terms of its transition from the old fashioned permanent license model where you saw people a disk in a box for your product into online and cloud based products and subscription based products. Um, and the management, we didn't think they spent enough on product development. We gave them quite a long time uh, to see if they could fix that and came to the conclusion at the end that they probably, uh, whilst they were going to certainly survive, I think, and be OK, they probably got too late to the game compared with some of their competitors, including Intuit, uh, which we continue to hold. And the fact that we do still have a holding in the area gives us some comfort. We sold an undisclosed position. We never got around to disclosing it. So it's on both sides of the equation here. We both bought and sold an undisclosed position. We started buying a company and uh, and quickly found, before we got to uh, 100 million pounds uh, of holding in it, that the, uh, the liquidity was not what we thought it was, that the, uh, the, the shareholder list was much too tightly held for us to get an adequate holding within our liquidity requirements. So we, we basically never uh, built up the position and sold it. What did we buy? Well, Amazon most um, prominently, uh, I guess, and another undisclosed position, which we're still working on, which we'll hope to tell you about in the next month or so. 
uh, once we've got our holding up to the level that we uh, we wanted to, to be at. Um, why Amazon? Why now? Well, I mean, why now? The returns have come. Well, first of all, we should have bought it earlier. Let's, be, let's put that quite clearly out there, quite clearly in terms of the performance. Although it's been weak, of course, in the last year, and that maybe is our opportunity. Um, you know, the numbers have started to come through in terms of returns. We've always thought historically that the the great retail business was such a drag uh, that it couldn't make our overall group returns, and we couldn't just own the web services business. That started to change. The returns on Amazon have started to get to the point that we uh, regard as acceptable through our, our measures that we use. Um, taking the businesses in turn, though, there are some other things to say about it. I mean, we've always liked the web services business. There's nothing not to like about it. It's uh, uh, as comparable to the one that we also like in our, uh, in our Microsoft own. So that's good. Uh, but the, the bits which I think either are changing and or we've reevaluated uh, in this business, I think are interesting. In the retail business, I think there's a big change underway, which is was certainly underappreciated by us. And I think somewhat still by the market, possibly. And that is in terms of the transition from first party to third party business. When Amazon sells stuff uh, in its e-commerce operations, some of it it sells as a principal in supplying the merchandise and some of it it sells for third parties the latter the third party business is growing much more rapidly and is now about 60 percent of sales and that's important to focus upon because it has quite different characteristics to the first party business most particularly amazon doesn't carry any working capital for that business the merchandise in its warehouses for that business belong to the uh, the principal vendor. And so it's ca it's cash flow and return characteristics are vastly superior to the first party business. Amazon just books a commission for processing this through its fulfillment systems. Uh, so there, there's a, a big advantage uh, in, in terms of that. The other thing is um, when it books a sale of own merchandise as a first party, it books 100% of the gross merchandise value, the value of the thing it sells. When it sells something that's third party, all it books is the commission percentage. And I think that some of the uh, analytical fallout from what the absolute sales numbers are, are because people haven't fully appreciated that the growth in the third party leads to lower growth in absolute numbers, but much higher growth in terms of, of profit and cash flow than first party business. Uh, and last, but by no means least, uh, there's the advertising business. You will have probably heard quite a lot about the implementation of iOS 14, the Apple operating system and the fact that uh, it makes you uh, have to opt in if uh, we're going to be able to trace uh, adverts in the way that people have through the old mobile device historically and that that's a headwind for some of the digital advertising businesses like our friends uh, Facebook or Meta as it now is and Google or Alphabet as it now is. Correct, uh, it is. Um, the great thing about Amazon is its data is first party data. It's not on somebody else's operating system. Um, uh, you know, the data that they collect on advertising is their own data. The adverts are carried by them and they know how effective they are because if you act on them, there's no doubt about it whatsoever. Um, and so they have a very big advantage. Um, they're one or two companies that are, that are like that, Amazon being the leader, that have got first party data as a result. Uh, in the last Amazon figures we had, this was a $30 billion business growing at uh, something over 50 percent per annum it's it's i think likely to become the third force in digital advertising and lastly i would mention prime prime's now grown to the point where it's quite a significant portion of the amazon business and has some characteristics which remind us very much of the successful club business which costco represents which is once you get people signed up for prime they on average buy far more merchandise and it locks them in uh, particularly since it runs across not just the uh, the e-commerce business for the sale of goods, but also across the entertainment business. Rotation, thought I should say something about this. Um, obviously, we had periods of rotation last year, and we've had one again uh, in the first half of January this year. Um, yeah, I mean, just looking back, uh, last year we were up 22.1%. We've shown you the index, but the value index was up 23.9%. The banks index up 33%, and the energy index was up 43%. In fact, I think the two best performing funds last year in the IA universe we're both energy funds. We're never going to own any, basically. Um, if you look at the last five years growth, compound annual growth rate in the right hand column, we are 17.7%, 7.8% for value, 5.7 for banks, one point, minus 1.9 for energy. I suppose in many ways, the question to ask ourselves is if we're sitting in five years time discussing this, will that right hand column have completely changed uh, direction insofar as will be the, uh, the bringing up the rear and the others uh, will have, uh, have triumphed over the intervening period? Or is this something which is a relatively short-term phenomenon? 
I've got a couple of slides that I think at least go to uh, towards that discussion. Um, this slide shows quite a long period of time, back to 1966, and it shows the return on capital for companies. The ones uh, in the red line started the period at 20%, and as you can see, it goes up and down, um, but there are those companies at 20%, same companies obviously through the whole thing. And then there's the green ones which started at 10%, and you can see it goes up and down, um, and uh, uh, it, 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 um, it, it gets to the end of the period at uh, somewhere around half what it started. Um, uh, the, um, the red ones have fallen perhaps to about 15%. Uh, and I think what this illustrates is that uh, profitability in terms of returns of companies is persistent. Uh, they, by and large, good companies don't become bad companies and, bad, and vice versa. Um, there aren't sea changes in the nature of, uh, of their business over time. And um, so, you know, we, we don't see very many of the, the companies that contributing to the red average end up being green and vice versa, um, which, uh, you know, as it says, can only really be explained by barriers to entry. The, uh, the companies with the good returns find a means of fending off uh, competition through what Murray Buffett uh, characterizes as the moat, their brands, their patents, their installed base of equipment, their control of distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it, does it does present a problem if you want to pursue the rotation because no amount of, of, uh, of, of low valuation and no amount of rotation is going to turn bad businesses into good businesses. You know, the energy companies and the banks and all the companies that we shun are not going to be transformed by a good month or a good year into good businesses. And over the long term, it's the returns that the business delivers which will drive the strategy basically. Uh, and if I take you on to the next slide, here's another illustration of it. This is by industry sector, and you'll see we've got a series of red and grey bars. The red bars are returns on invested capital for a 40 year period, 63 to 2004. And the grey bars are a shorter period, 20 years, 1995 to 2004. So we can see how this has changed. And you'll see there are industry sectors there. So the good companies with the high red and the high grey bars, as it happens, are pharma, household and personal products, software, media, uh, you can see their co commercial services, etc. cetera, healthcare, um, consumer beverages and uh, consumer staples. And out to the right, bad uh, returns, which remain bad returns by and large, utilities, telecommunications, transport, energy, materials, retailing. You know, we aren't seeing a chart here where the red bars suddenly become uh, much lower in in the in the second part of the period, or the uh, the red bars on the right suddenly become much higher in the second part of the period. Mostly, these industries are sticking with their existing characteristics. People talk about, well, that's um, data that's a little bit aged. Now we've got more recent data. We have it doesn't change. Disruption isn't changing. Is it? it might be changing things within industry groups uh, in terms of who's. Uh, benefiting within industry groups, but it's not suddenly going to propel energy companies up to making returns like software companies. That's not what disruption does, basically. Um, inflation. Um, we've clearly got inflation. Can you take us on, please? Uh, you'll see I mentioned the annual letter inflation, but at the moment, the, the biggest inflation is actually commodity inflation. Um, and it's not, although, although it's substantial, I think the CPI numbers out today in the UK is 5.4%. Um, it's not as anything like as substantial the consumer end of this. Uh, and in fact, if you look at these numbers, there isn't a great correlation between commodity price inflation and consumer price inflation. So these are Federal Reserve figures. They take a number of basic commodities for various, varying periods, some quite long ones back to 1958, some more recent ones. And you can see there is no correlation. These are pretty much uncorrelated. There's, some of them have even got negative correlations, things like uh, copper and crude oil. So. Commodities do not appear to drive uh, CPI very well. And there's a reason for that, which is we consumers don't buy commodities. We buy finished goods and services, even things like oil. We don't go and buy crude oil. We buy processed products. We buy gasoline or diesel or heating oil or lubricants. Um, so it's the first impact of inflation. And sometimes, but not always, the only impact of inflation is not on the consumer. It's on companies. So how are companies affected by input inflation? Here's two examples, and these two examples are basically companies which are our average company from our see-through table and the average company from the S&P, which is the index we've got most stocks on. So, you know, starting with uh, the company that's part of our portfolio, the FEF company, I guess it's called here, you'll see the revenues are 100, and at the moment, the cost of goods sold are, are 34, which gives growth profit margins, as we saw earlier, at 66%. 
their selling general revenue administrative expenses is 39 percent of their revenues and that drops down into an operating profit of about 27 percent okay there's five percent inflation in cost of goods sold suddenly their cost of goods sold goes from 34 to 36 percent uh, as a result of which uh, their gross profit clearly drops from see 64 to 60, uh, 66, 64%. And um, we're assuming no change in selling general administrative expense at the moment. The net result is a decline in profits of 6%. Uh, now I realize we're doing an all else remains equal there and we can come back to that in a moment, but at least initially, usually things do all remain equal. Um, our S&P company has revenues of 100. It has cost of goods sold of 55. Um, and a gross profit margin of 45%, as you saw in our table earlier. It has 30% selling general and administrative expenses, and as a result, an operating profit margin of 15%. Um, up go the COPs from 55 to 58%, a 5% uh, increase. When you work that one through, it's an 18% drop in profits. The biggest immediate defense you've got against inflation is a high gross margin because the thing that's being inflated is a relatively small part of your inputs. Now, people will come up with all kinds of other things to say about this. Ah, but they'll put up prices. Yeah, they probably will, but not immediately and maybe not at all. You can't just put up prices. Um, if you take if I take you on to the next slide, I'll give you an illustration of that. Um, this is two actual companies. Uh, that we are comparing rather than uh, averages taken from our uh, our uh, uh, see-through chart. L'Oreal, which we own, and Campbell Soup, which we don't own. Have a look at these two. L'Oreal, 100 in revenues, 27% cost of goods sold. Doesn't cost make, to make what they, uh, they, they sell. Gross profit margin, 73%. Selling general and administrative expenses, 55%. Operating profits, 18 Up go the cost of goods sold by 5%. Uh, and you'll see that the result of that is a 7% drop in profits. Um, if you go over at Campbell's, revenues of 100, cost of goods sold of 65%, 35% uh, gross profits, not much selling general and administrative expenses, just 20%. So they've got pretty similar operating margins, funnily enough, to, uh, to uh, L'Oreal. Um, a 5% increase in their cost of goods sold from 65 to 68% is 22% off their profits. Um, and there are lots of things to say about this. I mean, you might say these are extreme examples. No, they're not. We put some of our software companies in the box instead of L'Oreal. Uh, they basically have cost of goods, uh, have uh, uh, gross profits in the 90s, some of them, certainly in the high, high 80s and into the 90s. They could see uh, uh, basically inflation uh, and not, not notice any difference whatsoever in terms of uh, profitability. And the other thing is it's not easy to put up prices. This is where we get back to uh, how does this affect the consumer. For Campbell's to put up prices, it has to go and agree it with those terrible people who are the buying managers at uh, Walmart and Costco and Tesco and Sainsbury's. Not easy. I mean, they usually do get through in, uh, some increases in inflationary circumstances, but certainly not immediately. Um, uh, whereas L'Oreal, of course, doesn't sell the majority of its products through supermarkets. Uh, its products are made through other channels, either traditional cosmetic channels or digital channels. So it actually manages to avoid that. So even if we get back to the, the biggest defense, maybe gross profit margins, but the second load of defense is putting up prices, which would get the CPI, L'Oreal is a lot better at it, as are our software companies than Campbell's, because they don't have to sell through the traditional retail trade. So fundamentally, I would suggest to you that our companies are as well positioned as companies can get in terms of their ability to survive the impact of inflation on their profitability, which is the thing that we should and do first worry about. But never mind that. How does inflation fit with the kind of strategy that we, we've got in terms of what happens to share prices? Well, here's um, a comparison. This is quality um, returns taken across a number of inflationary periods. So we're taking the quality subsector of the index here and looking at their returns, which I guess we're saying to you, let's take that as a surrogate to some degree for what we do. Then the middle column is quality plus value. Now, this is not the quality segment of the index plus the value segment of the index. It's the quality segment of the index with the top quartile of companies in terms of valuation excluded. So it's quality with a uh, a mechanical valuation overlay on it. And then as you can see on the right, we've got the S&P 500 return. And if you look down these, you'll see that in most periods, the quality return exceeds the S&P return during periods of inflation, 14.4% uh, in, the, in the first periods versus 49 
um, uh, and, uh, and so on. But uh, even when it doesn't work, so if you can see in the second period, 1940 to 43, 12.8 against 13.4, if you still at least have the valuation overlay, you still get to an 18.5% return. Because of course, what you're doing is somewhat mitigating the, uh, the effect where inflation or interest rates affect the very long tail assets with very high valuations. And so if you look down that chart, there are actually only two periods when uh, quality alone didn't outperform. And I think it's 40 to 43 and 1973 to uh, 82. And even there, once you put the valuation discipline into place, you still outperform. So you know, we are going to get some pretty big bumps in the road, I suggest. We're having one right now. We'll probably get quite a few more as this develops, but both fundamentally and in terms of any kind of medium term outlook, I think these things are quite well placed. Lastly, interest rates, because we talked about inflation and about interest rates, which are the reaction to uh, to inflation. We've just taken you back to the start of our, uh, our of our fund and we've shown you the periods of rising interest rates in red, uh, falling interest rates in green. And when we show you what the 10 year rate went to in that period, you can see back in uh, in 2011, we were getting to uh, 10 year rates, which are not adjacent to where we're going now by the look of it. Um, and you can see what happened to our performance. So uh, below FEF versus S&P value, how did we do against value stocks? And the S&P growth, so surrogate for the strategy against S&P value. And you can see, well, here's a shot. When interest rates go up, we underperform a bit, and so does the uh, so does the value, um, uh, the growth segment of the index versus the value segment of the index. And when rates go down, we're, we outperform a bit, which is pretty natural, really, because obviously we are slightly higher valued than the index, and also our companies are growthier and therefore seem to have better prospects when interest rates slow down and people think that growth may become more muted. And look, you could try to play this if you think you're really good at um, uh, forecasting interest rates. We're not going to be doing it because we know we're not very good at forecasting interest rates. Um, but bear in mind the following. If you look over to the right and say, well, great, we know that we'll have the performing periods of rising rates uh, and we know it will outperform in periods of rising rates. What does it all amount to? You can see if you just ignore the noise, you get a much better result from the uh, from the either us versus the value or the S&P growth versus the value in terms of outperformance. ESG, um, almost impossible to speak about that asset management without talking about ESG now, I think. Um, this is a good piece of research. I don't know if I've mentioned to any of you before, uh, but it was published in April of last year. A piece of academic research, snappily named Honey, I Shrunk, Shrunk the ESG Returns. And what it says is that when they look at performance by ESG portfolios, 75% of the, of the outperformance on ESG portfolios is derived from traditional quality factors. Uh, in relation to the uh, to the, uh, the choice of stocks in there. And the reason I like this is because it, it seems to me to accord with what we've been saying about ESG from the beginning, which is not let's ignore ESG uh, or anything like that. And my remarks about Unilever, by the way, have been interpreted that way and are definitely not meant to, to, to convey that. But rather, I think when you're thinking about ESG, you need to think about it in the context of sustainability more than just talking about hazardous waste and water consumption and greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and the quality in the workforce and management. So you need to think about fundamental sustainability of business in terms of its organic growth rate, its product innovation, its R&D and so on and so on. And that's what I think we've been focused on from the get go here. And what I'm saying with this piece of research is I think it supports the case. I'll go over these quite quickly because I see we're just about coming out the 40 minutes. These are a number of the ESG factors which you'll see uh, normally people are looking for. So quite, you know, total waste, hazardous waste, water consumption, energy, greenhouse gas emissions. There's us at the top compared with the MSCI world. Uh, and you can see we're much better than the MSCI world. Well, that's not exactly shocking given that we uh, we don't own businesses in a number of very vulnerable sectors from this standpoint. Um, the one on the right is, and I prefer this, we here we put the same metrics, but we measure them against some measure of output. So it's, you know, instead of just saying in absolute how much greenhouse gas the company uh, emit or what's its hazardous waste production or its water consumption, how much does it produce uh, uh, or how much does it use relative to a pound of free cash flow? And I think that's quite important. The absolutes in themselves don't tell you very much. And there again, obviously, it's superior. From environmental into the next factor, social and governance, you can see if we look at these, uh, there's the, the Fundsmith portfolio, FEF versus the MSCI world, percentage of employees who are women, percentage of employees in management who are women, percentage of executives who are women, percentage of women on the board, we're all better. 
Right? And this is not driven by the sectors that we operate in, particularly number of non-executives, we're better, number of non-executives on nomination committees, we're better, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think our portfolio, and this is not our uh, FSEF portfolio, our main portfolio stacks up pretty well. Um, and now I, I won't dwell on it, but there's the disclosure in terms of our companies uh, into, uh, that have uh, aligned themselves with the various mandates for, for temperature uh, control and, uh, and how they qualify. Um, we've got a, a team now that does this for us and have had for some time. They've very, produced an awful lot of material. They've made over 7,000 notes of some sort on the activities of over 80 companies. Uh, which is a lot of words, as you see there, and we have a hundred different topic tags. So if we or you at uh, any point want to know something about uh, supply chain, or we want to know something about palm oil, or we want to know something about hazardous waste production, um, we almost certainly have a tag in which we can pull out all of the data that we've got from the companies that we've looked at and, get, and give ourselves or you a report on it. Last topic, other. Tell some comrade. Succession planning, I've done some of that. As I think you all know, Julian is the person that will take over from me, uh, we expect. Uh, we also have uh, developing behind Julian some capable people as well. Uh, the only extra thing to say is I'm trying to put in place a piece of succession planning in which the majority of my stake in the fund management business is placed into a foundation. Uh, if I can accomplish that, the foundation will be controlled by a council, which will consist of me and three other current partners in the business. Um, it will no longer be owned by me at that point. It will be the own, it will be owned by the foundation. Um, and the majority of beneficiaries in the foundation, at least, will be people who work in Fundsmith. And that's very important, I think, because what I think in a fund management business you need are good fund managers and good salesmen and good operations people and so on. And it would not be a good world in which uh, I were to, uh, to cease to be around and uh, my stake in the business were owned by my daughters who've got their, in, uh, their own things to do in life, their own interests, their own careers, and don't want to be in the fund management business, which is a good coincidence because I don't want them to be either. And I don't think it would be healthy to have the majority of the firm owned in that way by outsiders or for them to sell it on or do anything like that. So I want to get the majority of the business into the hands of the people in the business over time. The, um, the, the, the big thing that we've got to get over in doing that is that will represent a change of control from a regulatory standpoint. Instead of me being the, the shareholder, it will be the foundation that's a shareholder and we're working through that at the moment. Um, but I think that is a big positive because what happens typically with businesses like this is if you don't do things like that is they are, they are sold or private equity um, or simply fail. And I don't want to see any of the above uh, occur. Uh, recent personnel change. Um, Simon, our long-standing CFO, departed. He announced his desire to do that at our 10th anniversary and is now gone. We're sad to see him go, um, and uh, it goes with our, uh, our best wishes. Um, we replaced him with three people, which probably told you something about why the poor chap wanted to go. Um, we hired Paul Manning as CFO, Robert Parker to become a compliance officer, and Nick Rakowski to become head of operations, uh, which are jobs that Simon headed all of uh, during this period. I think the, the job had got very broad. Paul came to us from IG Index previously and has wide experience. I worked with him at Tullet Prebon, where he was my CFO there. And before that, he was CFO for three FTSE 250 groups spanning uh, logistics, uh, um, a construction and packaging. He's got a, a wide experience and is a, uh, a very talented CFO. Robert came to us from Jupiter, where he was the long-standing uh, head of compliance for uh, about 24, 25 years. And Nick came to us from Shrovers. Uh, basically, what we've done here, and I think throughout the business, is strengthen the backbone of the business in terms of its operations in the last year or two. I think that's it from me. I've overrun slightly. I apologise. That's why I was talking quickly during that. <laughs> Uh, Great. Thanks, you kept Thanks Terry. Uh, do you want to put your camera on so people can see you when oh, yeah. you're answering the questions? Yeah. There we go. Perfect. I'm Good stuff. On. So uh, lots of questions and uh, quite a few on uh, both Unilever and Microsoft with regards to recent uh, 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 acquisitions or proposed acquisitions anyway. Um, yeah. So we'll take those separately. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Unilever GSK consumer uh, uh, yeah, look, I'm frankly anti it, um, and uh, I've told them that. I had a meeting with them and told them that. Uh, why? Uh, uh, it's, it could be a long answer. This one. This is Unilever has been a disappointing performer. It's uh, you know we've we've held the shares since inception. 
it has underperformed. And when I say underperformed, I mean it has produced a half of the returns uh, of the index or major competitors like PNG and, um, uh, and Nestle uh, over that period. We're not obsessed with share prices, but sooner or later, the fundamentals do get reflected. And the reason for that is I don't think the management has performed. They have not driven this business to produce the kind of um, sales growth and returns on capital and cash flows what it should be capable of producing, uh, basically. And um, uh, I think allowing them to venture out on buying a business, which is in an area which they are not familiar with. This is a um, over-the-counter healthcare, uh, beauty and oral care business. They had very limited uh, exposure to that in the form of, uh, uh, you know, a little bit in oral care and a little bit in quasi-beauty. Um, I think it's quite dangerous. I think it really it, it would behove them to focus upon de benchmarking themselves against their competitors and delivering a performance for the business they've got, uh, which is operationally excellent, uh, before they think about any further adventures. I mean, there are lots of reasons I could go into on that, but obviously there are other questions. I want to keep it brief for you. Um, I mean, the only acquisition they've made in recent times, which um, is in any way adjacent to this, is their purchase of Dollar Shave Club. Uh, which they allegedly paid a billion dollars for. I say allegedly because they never revealed what they paid for it. And um, they never told us how it performed. And I can assure you that is not because it's performed well. It's disastrous, frankly. And I am not convinced that they have within them the expertise to take on uh, a major acquisition of this size uh, in, in this unrelated area, which will also, in order to leverage the business, mean that they will end up having to sell some major parts of the food business, uh, which of course is something they are very familiar with. So I'm really quite concerned about, I'm less concerned about the Amazon, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> Amazon, the Microsoft acquisition, I apologize. Um, why? Um, well, I think it's an area, first of all, unlike uh, our friends at Unilever, it is an area that they already know. They are already familiar with the gaming uh, business because they're in it. Um, and secondly, it might come as some surprise to people, but it actually doesn't look all that fantastically expensive. They're buying this on something like a three and a bit percent free cash flow yield, uh, which doesn't look bad uh, to us uh, in terms of, uh, of what they're getting. So uh, it's a big acquisition, the biggest ever uh, actually by, uh, by Microsoft, but it's in an area that they've got some expertise in. Um, it doesn't look too expensive. And I think an awful lot of, of people's reaction to it, some of mine included or people of my generation is, can a gaming company, uh, you know, of, of that sort of gaming, ever be worth that kind of money? And of course, one suspects that the future in terms of revenues here, of the present and the future, is not purely about subscriptions and gaming. It's about linking it into other things. So we're back to our good old friends like um, uh, online advertising and so on. Again, where we're talking about the ability to generate first party data from these uh, uh, from these things, which is highly valuable. So I'm less concerned about that. I'm also less concerned quite simply because um, I'm quite open about this. I think there is a huge question mark over the uh, Unilever management and there's much less of a question mark over the Microsoft management who have uh, implemented impeccably under Satya Nadella. And I guess those factors to, all taken together mean that they get the, uh, that good old fashioned thing from me, the benefit of the doubt. Good, thank you. Um, obviously, there's been a number of changes within the portfolio. How has your investable universe of stocks changed over the past year or two? Um, yeah, I mean, look, we've got a few extra names into the investable universe, not a large number, but we've got a few in there which uh, which we've been researching and, uh, and, and have bought in over the last couple of years uh, that, uh, that we're not just looking down the list now to see, uh, pardon me for looking away from the screen, I'll just put this up in line with the camera so I can see it. And, uh, you can, I can then tell you. I mean, some things that we've um, been researching and have thought more about and therefore have come into our investable universe uh, in recent, I mean, Otis came in, but it came in because of a, a spin out from uh, from United Technologies, which owned a number of other things that we would not wish to own, like Sikorsky helicopter uh, and so on. Uh, so that came in uh, purely from a spin out, but other things which have come in uh, uh, in the period, Adobe came in, we, uh, we did more work on Adobe. We've been working for quite a long time on research on that and uh, and that came in uh, in relatively recent. I think Paychex, uh, which does the, uh, the smaller end of the payroll processing and HR software market to our friends ADP, was a relatively uh, big addition during that, uh, a relatively new addition to it. Uh, Viva Systems came in as well. I mean, we, we haven't touched Viva Systems probably just as well in terms of its recent performance. Uh, Intuitive Surgical, the manufacturer of the Da Vinci robot, uh, you know, we've got some 
knowledge we think of the surgical robotics market through our striker uh, holding and we decided that uh, insurance was one that we should uh, have in our investment university we haven't purchased uh, this but uh, but it came in so that's those are the main changes i think that, that spring to mind in the last sort of 24 months okay thank you um Someone's uh, noted that Clorox was a very short holding period in 19, uh, sorry, 2019 20. Um, right. This is clearly not your usual modus operandi. Was it a mistake? Uh, no, no, it was, it, it was not a mistake. It was um, a sort of a surprisingly good result and an opportunity. Uh, we knew Clorox very well. You probably know it as well. FMCG company, very US centric. Uh, basically, household cleaning products is the majority of the portfolio with a little bit of personal care and, and food products uh, as well. Um, not a particularly exciting business in terms of growth. We knew that when we bought it, but it had spent a long time descending over the years from uh, from a bid approach that it had from uh, uh, Carl Icahn some years ago. And it had got to the point where we thought, yep, look, we think the gross rate plus the free cash flow yield uh, gets us to the point of, uh, of wanting this. So we went out and bought, started buying some in 2019. Uh, and then a pandemic happened in, uh, in, in, the in the first quarter of 2020. And the share price went up like a rocket as people uh, went out there and, uh, and loaded up on disinfectant wipes and, uh, and bleach. And uh, first of all, it, it basically, um, uh, I think it's several years of, of growth during that period. I, I don't think it will see the sort of free cash flows that it was able to generate during that period for five to seven years, uh, basically. And the share price, of course, as it often does in these circumstances, started to discount this as if it was going to be around forever. Uh, and you know, when we manage money, it's always a, not just, well, why did you sell it, but what else was there to buy? I mean, we have to make choices in this. Uh, and it's a good thing. It's a good discipline to have to make choices. So it's not just, well, you know, you were sitting there thinking, well, Look at what just happened to Clorox. At the same time, a couple of companies that we followed and uh, and really liked, uh, in particular Nike and Starbucks, uh, had fallen over. The uh, the events of the of the pandemic led to 40% plus price declines uh, in the share prices of Nike and Starbucks, which we thought were likely buying opportunities. And so we uh, basically uh, switched our Clorox into into those. I mean, quite often what we are thinking about in those circumstances is. is the events mean that we should think less about time scale or more about relative opportunity when we get to events like that. OK, thank you. Um, can you foresee a situation where governments actually manage to effectively regulate big tech? No, not really. Um, I think that uh, this, is, this is something of a fool's errand would be my view. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the nature of the industry makes that incredibly uh, difficult because you know, even defining what you're trying to regulate is pretty difficult. People talk about, you know, social media and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, things like uh, uh, Meta or Facebook share in, in some of that. Uh, you know, it kind of depends on what, you, what, what it is you include in the, cal in, the, in the calculation. So if you take their WhatsApp uh, uh, application, which obviously is uh, uh, you know, a very large part of it, I mean, what should you include in this? Should you include other forms of digital communication? Presumably you should. Um, and it's really incredibly difficult to define, uh, I think. And obviously the industries are very mobile. Um, you know, the, uh, the fact is an awful lot of these industries uh, can move um, what they do in many respects almost instantly in terms of changing it from one place to another because it, the work is done essentially where, where the servers are or even when it's not instantly, quite quickly in terms of building uh, operations where people can operate uh, from facilities in places like in India and so on uh, to do uh, to do the business. So I think it's unlikely. I mean, I think it's possible that what we will see is something like the kind of rerun that we had of events in the oil industry a century ago uh, with the breakup of Standard Oil, but they might manage to hit one target in there uh, and do something to one target in there. Uh, but I think having done that, if that, if that is the outcome, and that's certainly, if you look back in history, that's where I would place my bet, that they'll, they'll certainly get their act together and finally get an FTC uh, action together and attack someone, probably Meta, I would say, is the most likely uh, victim from this. Uh, I think that the thing that they'll probably discover, as people did, for example, if you remember the Justice Department action against Microsoft in the browser wars, is that they've not actually achieved anything that breaking it into three bits 
doesn't destroy the business, probably doesn't destroy any value any, uh, either, and doesn't make the problem go away. You know, uh, if, if you may recall that the, uh, the Justice Department uh, intervention was to stop Microsoft, uh, including the browser in, in the Windows product, and, and in so doing suppress the, uh, the Netscape Navigator product, well, it certainly managed to stop um, uh, Microsoft from effectively becoming the, uh, the leader in, uh, in online search, but it didn't help Netscape Navigator very much. It led to the rise of Google. You know, I uh, I just think governments are incre incredibly blunt instruments when it comes to doing things like this. OK, thank you. Um, so we're coming up to four o'clock, so maybe time for another few, a uh, couple more questions. Have recent yeah, I have a rat of it, so keep going if, if you want. Don't worry. Have uh, market, uh, recent market moves brought any investable universe stocks into buy territory? Yes. Yeah, yeah, a couple have come into buy territory. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, a broader question here. Do cryptocurrencies represent a systemic risk to the financial stability of the broader market? Uh, it's, good. it's a great question. Um, I suppose the answer to that is yes, actually. Um, that if a, a cryptocurrency or cryptocurrencies uh, were to become uh, an effective replacement for the reserve for reserve currency, then we would have something different on our hands because uh, quite clearly it's not control or not easily controllable by governments and and, and uh, uh, you know governments like to have control of currencies and uh, particularly the United States like to have control over the reserve currency the U.S. dollar. So I think the answer to that is probably yes. Um, I think there are ways from it at the moment because um, if you were to define a currency. Um, uh, you know, now my, my economic studies are a bit old now, but one of the things that's a defining characteristics is a relative um, uh, stability of value. So that if I pay you, comrade, to buy your car uh, from you this afternoon and I give you one Bitcoin, uh, which my screen tells me is uh, is currently uh, 42,000 bucks. I don't know if you'd accept that for, for the, uh, the comrade motor at the moment. Uh, but anyway, that's if I gave you one Bitcoin. Not. OK, so well, we could be overpaid, comrade, clearly. Uh, yeah, we could come in tomorrow and find that I paid you 20 percent more or 20 percent less. Uh, and clearly that's not something that people can use, therefore, as a medium of exchange for a currency. So I don't think it's it's there yet in terms of it being used as a medium of exchange. Um, but that's not to say that it won't get there. I mean, the um, you know, the howls of protest from governments trying to uh, regulate the Libra um, initiative or, or uh, kill the Libra initiative, which I guess they have, by uh, by Facebook in terms of a uh, uh, not a, a, a cryptocurrency, but a basket of currencies to make a stable currency, told you an awful lot of what you need to know about how governments view something which they can't control. OK, and then uh, finally, uh, what concerns you most at the moment with regards to the portfolio and I guess in uh, the markets as well? Um, yeah, I, mean, I suppose the answer has got to be inflation. Um, yeah, it's I think there's uncertainty regarding inflation, although I'm relatively sanguine about the fun and fundamental positioning of our portfolio in that regard, it can have a big impact upon valuation. And, and clearly, even though we might feel comfortable that our companies are going to sell through, we could have quite a long time of holding our breath in an uncomfortable situation to wait for that. Um, I don't know the answer for that. I think this is uh, uh, we won't know the answer until we've lapsed the events uh, of, the, of the pandemic and the supply chain and the great the great resignation uh, and all those things which obviously calls this uh, uh, inflationary environment at the moment. So we've lapped those and see what the secular trend is. We won't know, uh, basically. We won't know whether we're heading back for something uh, which is more dangerous or whether this is a temporary blip and we're going to go back into the relatively benign inflationary environment we had before and it will be business as usual. Um, who knows, I think is the answer. If I had to place a bet, I'd probably place it on the latter, uh, that we will, we will go back. Uh, because clearly we can see what the cause are of these events and presumably they will unwind, that people won't continually just not work and uh, and supply chains will gravitate back to a degree of normality. Uh, and then, we'll, you know, uh, will we have inflationary events then or will we actually find that we've got uh, uh, the, the reverse gear engaged? And I think that's quite likely. OK, thank you. So four o'clock, we'll uh, we'll end there. Thank you very much for that, Terry. Yep, thank you all. 
To all the team at Fundsmith, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Our team of advisors are available if you have any further questions. Further information on the fund discussed can also be found on our website, midirect.com.mt.